Roy Ditto, President and CEO of the American Public Power Association, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of Public Power Conversations. In July, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, released a draft report discussing the removal of four Lower Snake River dams, citing the risk of salmon extinction as the impetus. Hydropower is key to ensuring that the nations and the, and the Pacific Northwest grids remain reliable, affordable, and sustainable. If the Lower Snake River hydroelectric dams were removed, customers could see electricity rates increase by 25% or more. Today, we'll discuss the benefits of hydropower and how dams in the Northwest are becoming more and more important from a reliability and clean energy standpoint. My guests today are Jackie Flowers, Public Utilities Director at Tacoma Public Utilities in Tacoma, Washington, and Gary Ivory, General Manager of Douglas County PUD in East Wenatchee, Washington. Welcome and thank you both for joining, joining me today. Good morning, Joy. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, thank you for having us today. Absolutely. So I have some questions as usual to guide the conversation, but we, we are free to wander off wherever it takes us. So let's just dive in. So let's start with a basic overview of hydroelectric power. Could you explain for our audience the history of hydropower in your region and how it works? Jackie, let, let's have you start us off for this one. Sounds great, Joy, thank you. I often refer to hydropower as the oldest developed renewable resource in the world. Um, you know, it's been more than a century since many places have put hydropower in place. And hydropower has a long history in the Pacific Northwest and has been as important here as it has anywhere in the nation in terms of its historic impact on economic change and electricity supply. In simple terms, hydropower takes advantage of what nature provides us. It is a clean, renewable source of energy that uses power of falling water in our rivers to produce electricity, which is then fed into the electrical grid to power homes, businesses, and industry without burning fossil fuels or polluting air. Each hydro project is a little different. Um, there are many types of hydropower facilities, but all use the kinetic energy of flowing water as it moves downstream, again, naturally occurring. Hydropower uses turbines and generators to convert water's movement to electricity. The largest share of hydropower in the Pacific Northwest is produced in the Columbia River Basin, which is made up of federal dams and non-federal dams. I'll let Gary talk about his facilities. And then, of course, dams in British Columbia, which sell, to, which sell power to the United States. Tacoma Power operates four hydroelectric projects, none of which are on the Columbia River. Um, those projects are on the Cowlitz River, Nisqually River, Cushman uh, Hydro Project, and the Winucci River Project. Our projects generate about 3 billion kilowatt hours of energy each year, which is enough for about half of our customers' power needs, the remainder of which comes from our uh, contract with Bonneville Power Administration. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> when you think of hydropower in the Pacific Northwest, I think one of the iconic uh, hydropower facilities is the Grand Coulee Dam. You know, it, uh, began operations in 1942. I still remember as a kid my parents taking me up to the dam and you know if you've never seen it before they have a laser light show on the face of the dam. They spill a little bit of water over the dam. It creates this white sheet and then they project a laser up on the dam and it tells the story of the Columbia River. It, uh, it tells the history of hydropower. So if you're a, a pub public power geek you should definitely put that on your bucket list. But you know, we're very fortunate here on the Columbia River to receive all this water flow from the Canadian Rockies. And also we have you know, large mountains here in Washington state, a lot of water that flows down into the Columbia River. The Columbia River is a perfect place for hydropower because it drops about two feet every mile. And so it creates this massive battery really from all of these hydroelectric projects in, in our area. But public power was really started back in the early 30s in Washington State. And uh, it's you know, in Washington State, we have a lot of public utility districts. About half of the power is provided by public power in Washington State, including uh, cities like uh, the Tacoma, uh, where Jackie works. So we're, we're very proud of our public power history here in Washington. Thank you for that, Gary. And it's interesting, uh, you know, for, for public power across the country, many of 
the original public power utilities that started in the late 1800s, 1880s, 1890s, started with hydropower facilities, small hydropower facilities. So you've got this also rich history kind of throughout the country. But in terms of your all's resources in the Northwest, I know there's a lot of uh, maybe a little bit of envy, um, you know, from other parts of the country about that amazing resource that you have. I also was able to visit some of your dams a, n- a number of years ago and was really amazed, not just at the, I mean, this was 20 years ago, but not just at the scope of the dams that you have, have uh, managed up there, but the simplicity of the the resource and how it works that Jackie described so well as compared to some of our other resources that we use for electricity production. So I think that's just an important component too. Um, okay, so um, kind of segueing to that in terms of resources, and, and I think you both of you mentioned this, but hydropower is by far the largest renewable energy source worldwide producing over twice as much energy as wind and over four times as much as solar. And pumping water up a hill, also known as pump storage hydropower, comprises well over 90% of the world's total energy storage capacity. 90% of the world's total energy storage capacity. Just wanted to repeat that one. But despite hydropower's outsized impact, a recent CNBC article called hydropower the forgotten giant of clean energy. Why is that? This time, let's start with Gary for your response. You know, the forgotten giant. I like that. I like what you came up with there. Um, I, you know, maybe hydropower is not sexy, like wind and solar, potentially. Um, I think what we're finding out is that, you know, our grandfathers built some of these plants years and years ago. It was very important for them and that in that period of time when they built these projects back in the 60s and uh, 50s. But, uh, you know, what we're finding through some studies that we're doing in the Pacific Northwest is that teenagers and people in their 20s and 30s don't even consider hydropower renewable anymore because of the sort of the influx of wind and solar and it's sort of front and front and center. We're building all these new wind and solar projects, but hydropower kind of gets forgotten about. And I I really feel like Americans are taking the reliability of our electric grid for granted. It's somehow magical that we plug devices into the power grid and it feels like we have this endless capacity, but we really don't. Uh, And so I I hope that we don't uh, take for granted the hydropower uh, capacity that we have in the Pacific Northwest. It creates a lot of reliability for us. I loved Gary's uh, visual image of, you know, previous generations working so hard to build these incredible, you know, enormous renewable resources that take advantage of what nature provides us. And most of the hydropower projects were completed in the early 20th century. And Joy, you talked about some in, you know, the late 1800s. And um, that means most people that are alive today were not alive during construction. They weren't part of that fight to bring, you know, renewable and reliable electricity to their communities. In real terms, the construction of these dams have revolutionized economic development and now are revolutionizing um, electrification in the Pacific Northwest. Without living through that massive change, it's probably hard to understand how complicated these facilities were and how hard people worked to bring them um, to, to our communities. And they've become kind of the background of quality of life today. And so I think um, people have almost gotten to the point where they don't even see them anymore. And that's particularly for newer generation. As you mentioned, it's the largest uh, footprint in our portfolio, power portfolio of clean energy. 40% of the nation's hydropower is now generated in the Northwest because of the investments of previous generations. But it's also um, not surprising. There's been a lot of focus in, in public policy dialogue around bringing wind and solar, you know, into our uh, power grids and our power portfolio to replace fossil fuels. And that tension around that topic has really generated the interest and and captured the imagination of the next generation. And so I think it's important for us to continue to talk about the important role that hydropower plays. Wind and solar are great, they're renewable, but they don't provide service 24 seven. If the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, you're not getting energy from those sources. Hydropower is our energy foundation and it allows us to meet those customer needs and firm up those intermittent resources so that we can make sure folks have electricity 24 seven. 
That's such a great point, Jackie. And I think it also speaks to, you know, when we think about it as APPA, there are all of the different resources that we use to produce electricity have pros and cons, right? There's going to be some really amazing features, and then there's going to be some some things we have to mitigate against, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. One of the things that uh, really struck me back when I was first working for public power in the early 2000s is in the 2003 Northeast Midwest blackout, the, the, end, the thing, the generation that brought that entire grid back online was the Niagara Hydropower Project. It was like they just, it's, it's, a, it's called a black star capability when you have to trip off um, and, and have a blackout because you don't want to destroy, you know, damage. You don't want to damage the electrical system when you've tripped off to, to bring the system back online. You need black star capability. And uh, Niagara was that black star capability for the Northeast. And again, you guys have even more massive amounts of hydropower there to just firm up and back up and keep your system so highly reliable. It's amazing. And people often don't understand that component, right, of, of hydropower. So um, let's go to the next question, which is um, kind of switching to some, some new demands on electricity. So new clean energy demands like electric vehicles and building electrification, kind of this electrification push that we have been seeing and embracing, they'll need new sources of energy. How do you envision hydropower playing a role there as we develop new sources of energy and bring more of our our whole uh, our whole economy into the electricity sector. So um, I think Joy, it's a great point, and and in particular as we look to um, decarbonize other industries, it's going to be important that we lean into the clean resources that we have. We can't afford to take a step back in terms of the elements of renewable clean energy that already exist in our grid and that are powering our grid. Um, for us, you know, clean affordable hydropower is central to our electrification efforts. Hydropower produces no emissions that contribute to climate change, making it a sustainable energy choice for the future. It's efficient, meaning 90% of the potential energy from that falling water is converted to electricity. Fossil fuels like natural gas and coal are only 50% converted to energy. So it's an important, efficient resource. The Columbia River system is a Canadian and American resource, which is co cooperatively managed with far less exposure to geopolitical conflicts and related price fluctuations of fossil fuels. Also, we don't have um, fuel costs with hydropower because the water moves naturally. And we're, we're just leveraging that, taking advantage of that to turn it into energy. All of these are important considerations for the future of our energy sources. Tacoma Power has made big investments into electric charging stations in our community, prioritizing building infrastructure in historically underserved areas. We're looking carefully at decarbonization of the building industry, working with our uh, friends at the Port of Tacoma for the maritime industry. These investments are critical to ensuring an equitable future and a clean future for industries beyond our own. And our hydropower is why we can do that. Well said, Jackie. You know, I, you know, I live in central Washington, and because our electricity is so inexpensive here, you know, our retail rates are around three cents a kilowatt hour. Natural gas really doesn't have a huge foothold here, so it's kind of interesting. Our, our homes are heated with electricity. Our hot water tanks are electric here, so we're really familiar with electrification. There's not a lot of fuel switching that's gonna to have to happen in central Washington. It's kind of a rural area, so it's not a large large load in the state. But when you talk about this uh, Clean Energy Transformation Act that has been uh, legislation that's been implemented here in Washington state, all new sources of energy in Washington state will have to be wind, solar, and maybe a little bit of nuclear. So all, you know, all I can say is these, these dams are like massive batteries and it will allow us to, uh, to integrate all those new renewables onto the grid, just like Jackie said, and we need to really preserve these assets so that we can electrify uh, the grid and, and also electrify the transportation system. Thank you for that, Gary. You know, yeah, the, it, it cannot be overstated how much, how important it is to maintain reliable electricity as we transition to cleaner and cleaner fuel sources and as we integrate other parts of our economy into the electric grid, it becomes even more important that the grid is reliable because there are other, you know, while we underpin everything now, there are elements of the rest of our 
economy that aren't as beholden on electricity for everything. But as we transition over to that, it becomes even more important that we have these reliable sources. And hydropower is eminently reliable and, and has all of these other features you all so eloquently discussed. So I'm going to switch back for the last couple, for this the second to last questions uh, question. Um, I'm going to go back to what I was mentioning at the beginning, which is discussion about removal of dams and the four dams that were sort of discussed recently as potentially being removed on the Snake River. What, what would be the, re given all of the, what we've already heard, what would be the repercussions of removal of, of the four dams that were proposed to be removed in terms of loss of energy and other functions? Gary, do you want to take this one first? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of... Uh very heavy duty discussions in the Pacific Northwest about removal of the lower four Snake River dams. Um, they provide a tremendous amount of capacity and capability for the hydro system to really keep the lights on. And we're moving into, or transitioning in Washington state into this clean energy future where they're taking our coal plant, our single coal plant in Washington state offline. Uh, and so, you know, we're, what we're seeing is a lot of growth in data centers and, and customers that want to come to the Pacific Northwest for this clean, renewable energy. At the same time, we're removing some of the baseload capabilities that the grid has right now. And, you know, to suffer further losses with removal of those dams would be uh, probably catastrophic to the Pacific Northwest power grid. There have been some instances, you know, in high heat events where the Tri-Cities, that area that's down in South Central Washington has really relied on those dams to, to keep the grid active and, and uh, manageable. Yeah, well said, Gary. Um, you know, the dams bring so many benefits to our entire region and the customers we serve. And I, we've touched on a number of those, the affordable energy costs for our customers, the renewable attributes, you know, that we're going to continue to build off of and leverage to further our climate goals in Washington state, a reliable electric grid. Um, as Gary mentioned, if the lower Snake River dams were breached, Tacoma Power would not have enough power in the wintertime to meet our customers' needs. Um, and, you know, during those peak periods when you have high demands within the region in a grid like this, you're competing with other folks in the wholesale market. And so if we did not have adequate resources to meet our customers' needs, we would find ourselves looking to purchase more on the market, which would be at a higher price because others would also need it. And in some cases, maybe it wouldn't even be available. And so, uh, you know, it's those periods of time that really make or break your budget and the costs of your uh, energy, and then importantly, the reliability of the grid. Um, our resilient electric grid in the Northwest is because of the hydro system and the Snake River dams, as Gary mentioned, help prevent blackouts in the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest heat dome in 2021. California likely would have had to institute rolling blackouts this past summer, if not for the role of the Northwest federal hydro system. So the whole region benefits from the strength of our hydro. And I love the way that Gary describes it as a battery. It's a battery without all the chemistry. It's a naturally occurring battery. And being being able to leverage that at points when you have high demand and not enough resource is really what leads to our stable grid. It really just makes me um, applaud all of the things that you all have done to manage such a complex system and also to support hydropower for, for you know many, many decades in the Northwest. And again, public power's footprint on hydropower is across the country as well. Um, and, and so I want to turn to on this last question to just talk about, um, you know, wh what are you doing in the Northwest to impact any of the environmental impacts of dams such that they are what, you know, what does that look like? What has been done? What's the real story here? Yeah, uh, in part, because I want to pick up on something you said earlier, there's no silver bullet in our industry, right? So, um, resources have their pros and cons and most resources have some sort of impact. I mean, just us being existing on the planet leads to some sort of impact, right? So, you know, for us, obviously there are impacts to natural resources such as the fisheries and we take salmon recovery seriously in the Northwest. All of us that are participating, you know, and receiving power from Bonneville Power Administration are committed to salmon recovery. We are to our own resources in other river systems in the Northwest and Tacoma. Climate change poses a major threat to fish and the environment, including harming ocean conditions. We're learning that ocean conditions are playing a huge impact in the salmon survival rates. 
Hydropower is a renewable resource to fight climate change. And as we've talked about before, we're leaning into that renewable re attribute to work on decarbonization of other industries. We're demonstrating in the Northwest that productive salmon runs can coexist with hydropower. Our customers invest every year to improve, maintain, operate facilities that are meant to protect and restore um, a wide variety of wildlife, including our iconic Northwest salmon. Tacoma Power also invests heavily in our environmental programs, including fish hatcheries, habitat protection, and restoration. I'm pleased to report that salmon returns into the federal system have significantly improved over recent years. Most returns have exceeded preseason forecasts, and several stocks are returning at or near record numbers this year. So we, we have a lot of work to do. We've made progress, and we are committed to salmon recovery. Yeah, well said, Jackie. You know, um, just to follow on with what she talked about for these recovering uh, stocks, uh, Douglas PUD has a sockeye run that comes through uh, through our dam and goes all the way up into the Okanagan Basin in Canada. And years ago, there were about two thousand of these fish returning, and it was almost on it was on the verge of extinction. And our biologists w went up into Canada and they started looking around in the stream beds to figure out what was going on. They were standing in a stream bed one day and it just completely dried up. And here are all these salmon eggs in a stream bed. And they thought, well, what the heck? Why did this stream dry up? They, they go upstream and they found, found out that the irrigation weirs up there in Canada were turned off in the fall sometimes for maintenance. And so we worked for years with the Canadian government to... Uh, improve the water flows in these stream beds and we we invested in a fish water management tool essentially with the Canadian government and this year we're very proud to report that the sockeye returns on the Columbia River are uh, in excess of 650,000 passing through Bonneville Dam so you go from 2,000 to 650,000 uh, we're seeing over 700 percent improvements in some of these stocks it's, it's a tremendous success story that do not get told. These success stories do not get told for the Pacific Northwest. This is not science. These fish are swimming through more dams than the salmon that are swimming through the Lower Snake River dams. And we're seeing these tremendous returns and records. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people like to say that the science has been settled. You know, dams are killing fish. We, do, we can disprove that with our actual feed on the ground uh, results from some of these studies that we do. They're not really studies, they're, they're actual improvements in stream flows. And we've got story after story about this, but they don't get told. So we're trying to get the word out. Well, I'm glad you guys are telling the story today. Um, and I, you know, I think that that's, um, it, it's an important thing. And I, I, because we're public power, um, we are you know, not for profit, publicly owned. Our focus is on reliability, affordability, and sustainability. So the story you told is is you all wanted to, to fix this issue. This is not a, an issue that you were just going to sit on your hands because your community, you know, wanted this these fish to continue to be around. And you figured out a way to work through it, um, working with partnerships in Canada and with other with folks boots on the ground, as you were talking about. So. I just think that's an amazing story that is, as you said, often not told, and we are trying to tell it now. We'll keep telling it, but the the partnerships and the understanding and the dialogue and the the facts are so important in these discussions and decisions because we can affect positive change while also preserving this amazing hydropower resource that, as Jackie so eloquently said, mitigates climate change impacts, mitigates greenhouse gas emissions very um significantly, especially in, in places like the Northwest. So we can do both um, if given the opportunity to partner and to, to bring practical solutions to the ground. So thank you all both. Anything else you want to mention before we before we end this, this very interesting vodcast? Joy, I just want to say thank you for acknowledging the partnerships because, uh, you know, to your point, we couldn't do this without those partnerships, right? And our communities in the Northwest are very committed to the success of salmon recovery. Um, we have the um, fortunate uh, ability to work with policymakers, sovereign Native American tribes, interest groups, et cetera, to figure out our paths forward. And we're also looking at, you know, Gary talked about um, other impacts to salmon. It, you know, we've got the quality of the fisheries, culverts. Uh, we recently were with Senator Murray at our um, water 
our water supply facility where we're going to be working with the federal government to get fish passage in, which is uh, touted to be the largest expansion of salmon recovery territory in the in Puget Sound. And so looking at all of these opportunities to strengthen the environment and build the success rate for salmon is important. We can't get laser focused on one thing that, as Gary pointed out, is you know, we're working to address those impacts and is critical and central to our ability to continue to boldly move forward with climate goals. So uh, it, it's kind of an all, all solutions need to be on the table and we all need to be working together with those partners. So thank you for acknowledging that. Well, anything on, on your end, Gary, anything, any final uh, words you want to impart Gosh, to the audience? I know we could probably have a full podcast on salmon recovery, right? You know, Douglas PD is the last dam on the Columbia River with fish passage. And we're helping our tribal partners uh, move fish beyond Grand Coulee Dam, sort of into that blocked area. We're producing a million extra salmonids for the state's orca recovery program. There are so many good things happening because of hydropower in the Pacific Northwest. And we're just very proud to be part of public power and, and part, of the, part of the greater good here uh, in Washington State and contributing to APPA too. So thank you for having us. Thank you all so much. This has been a really uh, amazing conversation. I always learn something. I've been in this industry now for 21 years, and I feel like I learn something new every day. Um, and this is an example of that because there are some some facts and some some stories you told that I hadn't heard before. And I hope the same is true of the folks listening to this and watching this. So again, thank you so much for being on and look forward to um, hearing more about all the great things you're doing in the Northwest as we move forward.